morning. I went away for a few days to work on my health. Some of you know that I had cancer five years ago and there were little signs that it might be trying to come back. So I had to deal with it and uh, things are looking better. I'm not out of the woods yet, but things are looking better. And I thank God for the blessing of places that stress good health. Went to Wildwood and they did me good. Cholesterol dropped about 30 points. Blood sugar went down. And my PSA went down a little bit. But it'll take a while, take some work. But uh, I feel I feel good about what I did, and will continue to manage some things very carefully. I'm going to be arranging to meet with the men of the church in about three weeks. Have a straight talk with the men of this church about our health. You recall when I got cancer five years ago, I had several sessions with the men. Some of you remember that. I've got some updates for you because some of us are still eating ourselves right into the grave, stubbornly refusing to hear and to do. Uh, let me be frank. Seventh-day Adventists have, in, by and large, abandoned the health message of this church. And that's just the way it is. And we preachers are the leading sinners. But I will share with our men and talk to you about some things. We're still making some excuses we ought to stop making. We ought to just do what God says. And I'll say amen for you. Amen. Keep it simple. Just do what he says. You'll be just fine. So I'm very glad for this time that I spent away and Praise God for the improvements made in my body and just ask for you to continue to pray. Uh, I don't need a bunch of folk running up to me with remedies. That's what I don't need. Uh, just pray. I've got a plan for remedy, but I don't need every herb and seed you've ever heard of. Well, I'm serious. I don't need that. And I will offend you. I don't need that. Uh, just pray for me. Uh, I've got enough herbs and teas I'm drinking now. <laughs> and pills and supplements. I, I got enough. And they're doing me good. Don't need a whole bunch. I don't want to hurt your feelings. But if you come, I'm just going to tell you straight to your face. I'm not interested. You know, you can't take, you can't spend the whole morning taking supplements. And there's a hundred out there on the, on the, on the, on the, on the internet. That you, some of you have been there. You take all that stuff, you'll spend all day just taking pills. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Got enough and the Lord will bless us and guide us. And I'm saying that to all to my friends online. Don't call me from Texas, from Brazil. Don't call me. <laughs> Not taking it. <laughs> Is that clear? Yeah. Now, y'all know me. You, you know me, Bob. You, you love me. I just have to be straight with you. Don't call me. Don't send me an email from, from Africa. I'm sure you got some seeds over there. I'll take the seeds we got here. <laughs> we'll all be fine. We're going to die of something anyhow, aren't we? <laughs> so uh, we got enough things we're taking, and they seem to be working so far. I want to say to our, our folks in Dulles, glad to have you with us today, that uh, in two weeks, our new youth pastor, Pastor Joel, who will speak to the uh, um, Alexandria congregation in the next service, will speak to you for the first service on the 21st for your service on the 21st, which is the first service here. So both campuses will get a chance to meet him um, personally. Let's have prayer. Guide us, Lord, as we uh, look in your book today. In Jesus' name, amen. The sermon I preached <clears throat> for second service in Alexandria two weeks ago, paying the bills, was a very, very serious sermon. 
And I think sometimes, even though it's the pastor's tendency to have you to laugh at yourself, sure it's good to see Deria Gadsden sitting in church this morning. Makes my heart want to dance all over the pews. But two weeks ago, we looked at that, that serious word, and, 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 and I looked at it because I'm, I'm convinced, uh, Carlson uh, Griffith, that we have gotten sucked into a way of thinking in the church. Seventh-day Adventists, last-day remnant people, have been sucked into a way of thinking that is so worldly we don't even know we're worldly. And money is one of those issues. And the purpose, uh, and Dulles, I'm clarifying where I was two weeks ago because you didn't hear the sermon, the purpose of that sermon was to say that as Christians, we should be doing more than making money just to pay bills. We should be using the money God blesses us with to advance God's work. I'm still not sure most people really got the message because we're locked in to the mortgage and the car note and the various debts and bills that we have. And we have a responsibility to pay our obligations, do we not? But that's not why God blesses his people with jobs. He supplies us with jobs and finance so that we, having a different philosophy of life, will spend, listen to me, with wisdom, not always buying the most expensive, not always having the most, so that we will be consciously, what word did I say? Consciously, intentionally, spending and doing in a way that we have something left to advance the cause of God. Do you have that, church? So, Dulles, we were there a couple of weeks ago. Now, together, today, I want to take that and punch it a bit further. I want to talk about the importance of losing control of your money. Yeah, to be saved, you've got to lose control of your money. Well, I understand why you're not saying amen, and it doesn't change the truth of what I'm saying. <laughs> Let's go to our text. Go to Mark. 12, and verse 41 to 44, and thank you, Elder Richard, for leading us into a good, clear reading of that passage. Book of Mark, the shortest and the oldest of the Gospels. It is, most scholars agree, you get very little deviation from this idea that the book of Mark is actually the memories of St. Peter as told to his nephew, John Mark. And in Mark 12, verse 41, you read, And Jesus sat over against the treasury. Let me read that to you in the Message Bible. In the Message Bible sitting across from the offering box. He was observing how. He was observing what? How. Notice, notice, notice. It does not say he was observing what they gave. He was observing how the crowd tossed money in for the collection. Many of the rich were making large contributions, as well they should. One poor widow came up and put in two small coins, a measly two cents. Jesus calls the disciples over and said, the truth is that this poor widow gave more to the collection than all the others. What's the rest of it? Notice, it does not say, it does not say she gave more than anyone gave. I know what that text said. 
said if you took all the giving that was done that day and put it together, hers was more than all of it put together. This is the evaluation now, George Young, of Jesus. See, one of the things I want you to get in this sermon today is that when we give in church on Sabbath, there are two evaluations going on, yours and his. They ain't the same. Because Jesus is not concerned about what you gave. He's very into how you gave it. Are you with me so far? Let me finish the text. Jesus called his disciples over and said, the truth is that this poor widow gave more to the collection than all the others put together. All the others gave what they'll never miss. She gave extravagantly what she could not afford. She gave her all. It makes you think when you read that passage of the ideal definition of sacrifice. You know, sacrifice is defined by not what you give. Sacrifice is defined, see me, by what you have left when you get done giving. The Living Bible translates this phrase, uh, they gave out of their wealth. The phrase, they gave out of their wealth. The Living Bible says, they gave a little of their extra fat. I guess they had fat cats back then as well. What do we really know about this woman? I'd like to take uh, Bible character uh, Keith and, and, and contemporize it. First, we know she was married because she called her a widow. Second, either the death of her husband or maybe some bad investment had left her destitute through circumstances that were not shared with us in the Bible. She had run into hard times, we know this, since her husband's death. She's down to just a couple of pennies. Third, we know she was a church goer. She was there giving church, giving money in the church. And fourth, she was a church supporter because even though she didn't have much, what was she doing, church? Giving what she had in church. So she's a church supporter. I believe because of this, we can uh, come to another conclusion, a sixth observation, and that is she must have loved and trusted God to provide for her needs. If you're putting your last bit of money in church, then you're trusting somebody beyond yourself. Would somebody say amen? amen. Now, these are a few conclusions we can draw about her, having just read what's in the Bible. I, 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 I'd like to paint this this, this, this modern picture of, of this dear lady. Uh, pleasant looking, but not pretty. Medium height and weight. She, she has a slightly graying hair pulled back into a bun. A little black dress-up hat that kind of slants over her head. Her dress is mid-calf length and is a floral pattern. She has on stockings, of course. She's coming to church. I'll just let that fly by. <laughs> she has on a pair of well-worn pumps, black and medium uh, heels, and, and her face is earnest but not pious. She's, she kind of clutches her little bag purse in her self-conscious manner of a person that's aware of the fact that she's around folk who are a whole lot more than she is in station and in life. She moves briskly and purposely to the offering plate, and without any fanfare, without any fanfare, she drops her money into the plate. Somebody say amen. amen. The last thing in the world she wants is to be noticed. And she's not noticed by, the eye, by those whose eyes are, are, are dimmed by the, by the cataracts of self-importance. She, she cannot be seen by those who have on the sunglasses of, of contempt for anyone not as prosperous as they are. She's invisible to those blinded by the spotlight of desire for credit and recognition, but him who reads the hearts of men and women. Yes, sir. Like a neon sign on Times Square, to him whose x-ray vision permeates the concrete fronts of human pretense, she's noticeable. She's noticeable, but more than that, she's more than noticeable. She's, more, she's notable. She's notable. 
the king of the universe, whose wealth cannot be measured by verbs and nouns, says, hey, I just saw a giver. Somebody came to church who really gave something. This temple that Jesus and disciples were in was the one built by Herod the Great. 46 years in construction. It was the epitome of worship in that day. Nothing had been spared to make it the best. In fact, there was so much gold used in the building, you recall the story, that when the Romans finally conquered the Jews and burned down the temple, there was so much gold in the temple that it ran between the bricks of the temple like water. And so the Roman soldiers, trying to get the gold, tore all the stones apart, fulfilling Christ's prophecy. Not one stone shall be left upon another. Included in Herod's floor plan was the court of women. The ancient Jews did not allow females, boys under 12 or Gentiles into the main part of the temple. And so she's in the outer court, but there so that everybody could give were these little boxes called trumpets. Each trumpet was for some kind of offering. Frank, sometimes it was for uh, the curtain. Sometimes it was for cleaning the floor. Sometimes it was for uh, beasts for sacrifice. The temple for women. One box might support the buying of grain and others for the oil. Some boxes for operations, expenses, and so forth. It was a good place to watch people. Now, I don't know about you, but one of my favorite things is watching people. Is the right nose when we fly together? I'm always going to sit on a seat right on the walkway. I like to watch people in the airport. The strained looks, the hurried looks. You can tell those who've been late all their life running down. <laughs> Some are strolling there in plenty of time. They've checked in. They're just fine taking their time. Others are eating, watching people. This was a good place for watching people. Someone was watching how they gave. See, that's, for me, always been the issue in church. Not how much is given, how people give. There are people who walk in CPC every Sabbath, and they give their last dime, and they brag about it. I read my Bible. Jesus is supposed to get the first dime. They come to church and give Jesus their leftovers. There are people who come and, and they try to bribe God. He said 10%. They have no intention of doing that. So they give him 5% and hope for a blessing. And then there are those, watch me now, who give the honest 10% and then add to it the church budget money. But their attitude is haughty and self-confident. And they're giving out of their abundance. And when they get done returning their tithe and giving the church budget, they got so much left. And that's what Jesus is looking at. What you got left and where it's going. This woman gave all. So God passes beyond this veil of human endeavor into the inner sanctum of human motive. And David understood this. And so David, David said in his book, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. And you, my son Solomon, the Bible says, acknowledge the God your father and serve him wholeheartedly with devotion, with a willing mind. For the Lord searches, the Lord searches, the Lord, somebody said with me, searches every heart and understands every motive beyond the thoughts. Oh, thank God we can come to church on Sabbath and hide our thoughts because if we couldn't, most of us wouldn't have the courage to come here. But there is that God, there is that unseen worshiper who's looking beyond the suit and the tie and the dress and he's reading not only what you gave and how you gave, he's reading why you came. Why you came. 
Jesus searches how they gave. He's observing the line of people giving in specific trumpet boxes, but Jesus is doing more than watching. He was analyzing their response. Uh oh. He was analyzing their response to the opportunity to give. He was looking to learn something. He, he wanted the disciples to learn something, for by passing these little boxes for giving was a cross-section of humanity representing the various kinds of motives that draw people to church. I was there that day. You were there that day. Short, tall, small, slim. Some were new converts who came that day. Others were born in the faith who came that day. Some came out of habit. Lord, forgive us for coming to church out of habit. And a need for social acceptance. While others, like the publican, there are few, hey, like the publican who come to church with their head bowed, not hardly willing to raise their eyes, knowing that the wages of sin are death and they ought to be dead, but they're glad they made it to church on Sabbath. There are few like that who say, Lord, have mercy upon me. I am a sinner. Some come like that during these synagogue services it was common to give an offering to the poor. The people of Jesus' day thought that giving to the poor was a great act of righteousness. They would not only give, but they would announce their amount. See, that was going on, Claude, that day. That was going on, Pastor Deans, that day. They not only walked by, can you see them in their long robes, custom-made, and their sandals, custom-made? Jeremiah! 1,000 pence, and they would yes. slap it in. Yes. Yes. You know, there's still a few churches that still do that today. And so Jesus, it must have, it must have almost made Jesus nauseated to see this kind of giving. He who gave all now watches those who give some. And they want credit for it. Yeah, you may roll up your money so that nobody can see how much is in the water bills when you put it in. You may discreetly turn your tithe envelope over as you place it on the plate. Seems so modest, so humble. Jesus ain't watching that. He's reading the heart that turns the envelope over. See, there's so many visible things we do. There's so many acts of worship we go through. There's so many, there's so many, so many traditions we follow in church and all that we do. And, and we think this impresses somebody, but it does not impress heaven. He's watching how the giving takes place. He monitors the motive, not the money. He counts the commitment, not the coins. He detects the desire beyond the dollars. He reviews the reasons, not the revenue. He still sits at the temple treasury. And today, he will watch, Chris, how we give. Well, how should we give? I mean, Rod Gaston, Ron Gaston, how, how should we give? Well, 2 Corinthians 8, 5 says, give yourself. Okay, I'll say amen. Amen. Yeah, first give yourself. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 says, give generously. You see, that's a dangerous word because I can't decide for you what's generous. Can I? Only you can. Only you can. Uh, you, you ever been in a situation in life, and it happens to me a lot, where extra money comes in? Oh, thank God. And then something comes up? Come on, y'all. You had your plans all set, you were going to do, and then something comes up it, with the car, with the house, and boom. Now watch my next sentence. See, God does that 
because he's trying to teach you money is never to be controlled by you but directed by God. Second Corinthians 9, 7 says, give cheerfully. Don't come and see me see all sad and down the mouth. Yeah, rough week. God knows. I'm going to give my tithe, but I tell you, God knows. God says, keep your money. Keep your money. I don't need it. Your attitude ain't right. You want to act like now that you have a major surgery because you're giving the money that is not yours. Tithe is not yours. Malachi 3, 7, and 8 says, give recognizing God's ownership, tithe your, your honesty, offering your generosity. And Proverbs 3, 9 says, give to God first. And 1 Corinthians 4, 2 says, give to God consistently. That's how we're to give. That's how we're to give. Why did this woman really catch the attention of God? Now listen to me. Please listen. In the days of this widow, the church had become particularly corrupt. It all started back in the Maccabean era. You see, before the Maccabeans, from the time of Moses down, all priests were of what tribe? Levites. And all high priests were descended from who? Aaron. And that was due to the incident that took place. Remember when Moses came down from the mountain and, 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 and the people were cavorting and he, he raised up the tablets and threw them down. You remember that story? And then he cried out, who is on the Lord's side? And the first folk to step up were the Levites. And God said, because of that, I will trust them with leadership in the church. But around 162 B.C., during the Maccabeans, the high priesthood came up for sale. And whoever had the most money could bid themselves into the general conference presidency. The priesthood became a political football, often awarded to the highest bidder. In the days, listen to me, in the days of this humble lady, featured in our sermon, Two wicked men controlled the religious life of the Jewish nation. You know them. They crucified Jesus, Caiaphas and Ananias. Both men had gotten their office by political uh, appointment and succession. And in most cases, the religious leaders of Christ's day were Sadducees. Therefore, they were Hellenists. They didn't even believe in angels running the church. They didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. They held office in the church. They were worldly, irreverent, pretentious, ambitious, and disloyal, and they ran the church. And the Jewish people knew this. In other words, they had plenty of reason not to give. See, I told you at the beginning of this sermon, this sermon is about letting control of your money go. The church was corrupt, Meshach. The, the officers were questionable. The, the money handling was, was at best superstitious and, 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 not, and not according to oil. This was, this was a day when you could legitimately say, I'm not putting my money in church. I don't know what they're doing with it. And then this was further, this was, this was further colored by the presence of the Pharisees. They were devout and exacting in many things of religious duty. They were blameless in attention to detail and spiritual order, but it was a form of self-righteousness. They could quote the entire Pentateuch, but would not bend to help a brother in need on the Sabbath. They made religion a burden to the people. They sucked away the spiritual life of the church. All this was going on while this woman gave all. This woman, hear me Adventists, this woman had plenty of reason to question the validity of the church. And don't you think for one minute this was some little naive pie in the sky sister. The awful spiritual condition of the church and the leadership was known to her. It was talked all around town. Everybody knew about this stuff. There was no secret. 
There was corruption. The folk knew that Caiaphas and Ananias were sold out. So this woman, hey, 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 this woman gave all, not because of, but in spite of. Is that you? Well, see, I'm not giving the church a budget because I, I, I don't know what they're doing with that. I, I, I'm going to select the offering I want to give to. Yeah, I'm coming right at you. Even in giving to the Lord, we still want to control our money. Either you're giving it or you're not. And you got folk in the Seventh Adventist church paying monkey shines with their tithe and the money because they still want to give and control. You do well to sit silently. You do well to sit silently. See, I call this sermon the cry of the widow's might because her act of faith is an indictment, an announcement, a command, but it's also an encouragement and an appeal. The world has been infested with people who try to use what they give as a means of control. Some of you have relatives who do that. See, I have a rule in dealing with family. I don't loan the family. I don't loan the family. See, if I loan it to you, the Negro, I mean, excuse me, I'm looking for you to give it back. If it's used the word loan, then give me back my money. You said, you said loan. I didn't say loan. You said loan. No, I got an attitude about that. See, if you want a gift to say, can you give me $50? Can you loan me $50? And you ain't got two cents. <laughs> Just say, can you give me 50 and so my rule with relatives is, if they come for money, I, I, I say, oh, okay, I'll, I'll, and I'll say to Sister, Sister Carol, I said, now, can we afford to give this? Yes. I said, because we can't afford to give it, we ain't loaning it. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying, talking to you about? The word loan means you're going to pay it back. See, I, 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 I have a dictionary. Loan means, <laughs> gift means, hey, see you later. I don't want to control people with my money. I'd rather give it to you. See, loan means then there's obligation. And a lot of us are into control. Even when we're, even when we're doing, we'll, we'll, we'll give, we'll give, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, okay, okay, all right, all right. And even when we give, you know, I, I, okay, I'll give it to you, but, you know, just remember. Remember what? <laughs> Either you gave it or you didn't. Are you listening to me, church? The danger of money is it gets inside your ego. The danger of money is we can use it as a wedge. The danger of money is we get clutchy about it. And therefore, even when we are giving it, Lord, help us. We want to use it as a rod of control. And quite frankly, uh, Scott, a lot of folk don't put money in church for that reason, because they can't control it. They can't control it. So there are people who not only want to part of the action, they want to control the action. They use their money to gain advantage, to intimidate, to influence. As long as things go their way, their pockets are wide open. When things don't go their way, man, those pockets get tight. See, that's why in my language, I never, ever say that I pay tithe. You ain't paying nothing. I return tithe. The minute I hear someone say, I pay my tithes, my alarm heart goes off. 
I said, they ain't got it yet. How can you pay when it ain't yours? Tithe is the Lord's. Somebody say that with me. The tithe is the Lord. Let's just say it one more time. The tithe is the Lord. No, say it like I say it. The tithe is the Lord. Now get the word tithe in there. Come on. The tithe. Now you get in the spirit of it. It's the Lord's. No one should ever brag about returning tithe. You borrow my lawnmower, you bring it back. I brought your lawnmower back. Well, you ain't said nothing. You're supposed to bring it back. You borrow my lawnmower. I'm not giving you credit for giving back my lawnmower. You can get no credit for me. Put it back where you got it. See ya. We have this attitude. The natural tendency of human beings is to be possessive and controlling. Jesus, talking to his people, wrote to Moses, When thou hast eaten and art full. Remember that text? Then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God to the good land that he hath given thee. Lest, when thou hast eaten and art full, and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein, and when thy herds and flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast has multiplied, then thy heart be what, church? Lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought forth thee forth out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, to raise up and forget. The cross of Christ shines in its benevolent, self-sacrificing way. The cross of Christ, folk, is embarrassing to the Christian church. Who is this God that does not wait until we are all right and righteous and yet gives all? Who is this God? Who is this God that does not operate on his suspicions he knows the dark secrets of our hearts, and yet he held back nothing at Calvary. Come on, church. We will give to people or help people if we think they're good. Jesus gave all to people he knew weren't good. How do you explain to the God of heaven? Because we have heard some terrible thing about the church and Thus we say we will send our tithe and offering elsewhere. And this God who knows everything gives everything. The cross is unconditional giving. It is not to be tied to I like the pastor or the leadership or the people, so I'll give. The cross of Christ says that we are enemies, enemies, yet Christ died for us. Come on, somebody. This woman gave more than all put together. If Jesus were talking to say, he would, today he would say, she gave more than all the gold in Fort Knox, all the diamonds in South Africa, all the oil in the Middle East, all the mink skin from the north. She gave all because she gave all that she had. She knew about the wrongness in the church, the hypocrisy. Maybe she read the statement, she didn't, just pretensive, in the book, Councils on Stewardship, Carlson, maybe she read this statement. I'll read it to you. The tithe is sacred, reserved by God for himself. For a long time, the Lord has been robbed because there are those who do not realize that the tithe is God's reserved portion. Some have been dissatisfied and have said, I will no longer pay my tithes. I have no confidence in the way things are managed by the work. But will you rob God because you think the management of the work is not right? Make your complaint, she writes. Make it openly, she writes. In the right spirit, she writes. To the proper one, she writes. Send your petitions for things to be adjusted and set in order, but do not withdraw your giving. 
and prove unfaithful because others are not. Now that gives you some idea as how much the Lord sees tithe as his. She says, if the leaders of the church are crooks, see, I, I, I'm watching your faces. You're having a hard time with this. She says, if, if, if you know, she says, make a complaint, tell them to their face. I know you're not doing right. Then put your tithe in the envelope, lick it, put it in, and shut up. Tell them, stand up in the board meeting, make your speech in the business meeting, but on Sabbath, Put the money in. Why? It's not yours. God will judge them. Don't have him judge you too. Oh, I know some of you are having a hard time with this, and I'm glad you are. Because until we loosen our hearts, until we loosen our spirits, So Jesus couldn't resist it. He said, hey, John. And I, I, I imagine, I imagine, my dear friends in Dulles, I imagine that as Jesus and the disciples were standing there, that the disciples were, of course, time because they were used to this style of giving. They were impressed. One of the Pharisees walked by, 1,500 denarii to the Lord's house. The disciples said, man, alive, look at that. Another hypocrite came by. I sold my house, a piece of property. I give half to the Lord. And the disciples said, whoa, man, look at that, would you? Jesus ain't saying nothing, not a word. Somebody else comes by and says, here, 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 Lord. I got some extra money. I give it all to you. Oh, the disciple said, you hear that? Jesus didn't say a word. Ellen White says they were about to leave. They were about to turn and go. Here comes a little lady with her little purse. She's waited till all this rigmarole has gone by. She does not want to be seen. She ain't got for two cents. And she's not going to announce that, Burl. So she's at the end of the line. Do you hear me? Folks, she's at the end of the line. And she looks. And she's so concerned she doesn't even notice her creator. And his cohorts keeps on moving. The disciples turn. You said, "Just, just a minute, just a minute." I I've been waiting for somebody to give something. What do you mean, Lord? That lady, a and she's already scurrying out of the way. See, folks, you need to know that when you really sacrifice to the Lord, you may never get any credit at CPC, but heaven sings a song. No body may send you a letter. There may not be any statement about you in the book, but in heaven there's a line written, sacrifice! Sacrifice. Heaven rejoices. Angels ring up a tune because somebody at CPC really gave some money that Sabbath because they gave their all. And I'm not talking about irresponsibility. I'm talking about real sacrifice. I challenge you to three things today. One, Lord, help me to understand what real sacrifice is. Two, Lord, help me to stop trying to control the Lord and the church with my money. Three, Lord, Forgive me, because I may never have ever really given in my life.
your heads are bowed. Your eyes are closed. Dulles, Pastor Teens, will, Deans will lead you now into your appeal. I want to talk to those of us sitting here in Alexandria. Today was a serious word. See, what I didn't mention to you is that there are two versions of this story in the Bible. The one I preached from is found in Mark. But dear guests, in the other version of this story is found in Luke 21. I find that interesting. Verses 1 through 4. See, the second version of this story appears at the beginning of Luke's sermon on the last days. Wow. Luke connects this incident with last day living. It's in the last days, Siloda, that the Lord is calling upon his people to give all, to lose control. Stop trying to control your money. Give it to the Lord. And let him influence you to give it where it's most needed. Father, here we are. We're pitiful. There's so much religious that we do that we think is more than it really is. But when it comes to giving, Lord, we have some growth yet to do. Haggai cried out because the church was broken, unrepaired, and the houses were large and plentiful. He said, the Lord's going to blow on it. Your pockets will have holes because the house of God is left in ill repair and you live in comfort. The lesson is clear. Our priorities with our money must change. There's a world to be won. There's a gospel to be preached. There is a humanity to be warned. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. There's one more sacrifice you could make today if you're here. The sacrifice of yourself. You've been thinking about becoming a member of CPC. Baptism, Bible study, the transfer of your membership and you want to present yourself to the Lord today for one of those reasons please church pray with the pastor send up a prayer right now in case that person is here you could do one of those three things because I'd like that person to come forward right now if you're here I want every head bowed every eye closed, every heart pray. Someone's going to come. Someone's going to come. God bless you, my brother. Just have a seat here next to the clerk. Somebody else is going to come. Come on, the ultimate sacrifice. It starts with sacrificing yourself. Please, just get up and come. Sit beside this brother who's already walked out. Would you do that now? Would you do that now? Thank you, Lord. As you instructed me, I took my time with this one. Didn't rush through it. You wanted the folk to hear it. And they have. People are thinking now. You're reading their hearts. Some have wrestled with some parts of the sermon. That's okay. I don't mind that. You don't mind that, really. 
May your spirit just keep working where it needs to work. We give you praise and thanks. And all the people said, Amen. Are you glad you came to church this morning? God be praised. Hello, CPC. Hello, Dulles. Hello, people watching us on the Internet. You're part of us.